what's up family church pastor jimmy here i remember when i was a kid and i was learning to drive i was driving down the road i reached down to fiddle with the radio i veered off the road and i ran over this guy's palm tree that he had in his yard i stopped got out of the car he came out and checked it out he said this is going to cost 150 bucks to replace the palm tree and you're going to have to replace it i said i'll call you tomorrow morning i was worried about it all night because i didn't have the money the next morning i called the guy and the guy says you know what you're just a kid. You were honest. You stopped. I appreciate that. It's probably a lot easier for me to replace the palm tree than it is for you. I'm going to give you grace. <laughs> Boy, was I glad that he let me off the hook. Well, our next teaching series is through the book of Galatians, and we're calling it Grace Rules. So which is it? Is it grace or is it rules? My answer is both. The Bible teaches the law of God and the grace of God. People wrestle with these two ideas coexisting. They want it to be one or the other. Some people say it's all about grace because our God is a God of love and grace and it doesn't matter what we do. Everyone is welcome. Others will say, oh, no, no, no. Don't tell people that. It does matter what we do. Our God is a God of justice. He always does what is right and demands what is right. True Christians must keep all the rules. Well, there's this tension to be managed, isn't there? Well, we know that we're saved by grace through faith. We don't earn our salvation. But we also know that believers in Jesus will live lives that line up with God's law. The gospel of Jesus proves that both ideas are true. On the cross, God executed justice for the sins of all who believe. The penalty was paid. When we repent and believe in Jesus, our sins are forgiven. So when grace rules, we sin less because God's Spirit works in us to help us live like Jesus. The book of Galatians is written by St. Paul, who calls himself a Pharisee of Pharisees. And this means he knew the Jewish law better than almost anybody else. Before Paul met Jesus, he was zealous for the law, and he believed that people needed to keep the rules if they wanted to be right with God. He believed in the rules so strongly that he went around killing Christians who preached that people could be saved by grace through faith alone. Then Paul had an encounter with Jesus that radically transformed his life. From the time Paul met Jesus until he was executed for believing in Jesus, Paul taught that grace rules. If anyone preached the gospel other than the gospel of grace, they were gonna hear it from St. Paul. In the first century, Paul was addressing the issue of circumcision. Some people were saying that to be a Jesus person, you first had to be a circumcised person. Can you imagine if we said that to join Family Church? All you have to do is go to First Connection, receive Jesus by faith, be baptized, and then if you're a man, you gotta have surgery. Well, Paul is saying that's not right. It's not Jesus plus circumcision equals salvation. It's Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. To preach anything else is to preach a false gospel because grace rules. You are not saved by what you do. But when you are saved, you will do some things. The rules aren't in place to constrain us, but to set us free from sin, to do things that line up with the fruit of the Spirit. When grace rules in us, we have the power to give up sin and live like Jesus. Our lives are characterized by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So right now, why don't you go ahead and get out your Bibles, turn your devices on, and open up to the book of Galatians and get ready for your neighborhood pastor to teach you how to let grace rule in your life. Man, don't you guys think I did a great job on that video? I mean, <laughs> wow, that was really... So uh, the reason we show that video is because uh, we have, this is one expression of family church. You know, we have 16 different family churches meeting all over South Florida this morning. And so uh, that's a video that we show to introduce every time we have a new teaching series, which we're starting right now. The most important thing we do when we gather together is to study God's word. So let's do that. Let's get our Bibles out. Turn your Bibles on. Grab a Bible from the pew in front of you and open up to the book of Galatians, which is in the middle of the New Testament. For the next six weeks, we're going to be studying through the book of Galatians, and we're going to be talking about this topic. We've talked about how grace is supposed to rule. Grace is a tough topic. Anytime I start talking about grace, I end up getting some emails, I get some feedback, because people get irritated by too much grace. Even Christians in churches like ours, they start to freak out a little bit because like, hey, 
If you keep telling people that they don't have to do anything for God in order to be saved, they're going to get in a lot of trouble. And so I get emails and I get pushback to try to correct me by saying you're preaching too much grace. And if I'm doing that, that's when I know I'm right over the target. Because this book of Galatians is written to teach us that grace rules. Now, how many of you guys had a tough dad? Anybody had a tough dad growing up? Your dad was kind of tough. Yeah, I did too. He's sitting right in here. My dad's an ex-Marine football coach. And when I was a kid though, my dad and my mom, they made me work. You ever had, you had a dad who made you work? I mean, they made me do jobs. They made me do chores. Then when I was just a kid, my dad had me out there mowing lawns all over our neighborhood. I had my own business. I mean, my dad got me to work. He taught me to work. He thought it was important. And my dad was trying to teach me that in life, nobody's going to give you anything. If you want something, you've got to earn it. You've got to work for it, which is a really good, important value for parents to teach their kids. Because when you work for something, you value it a lot more. But when it comes to Jesus, working with Jesus, walking with Jesus is counterintuitive because walking with God and having your sins forgiven and being right with God isn't about earning it. It's about receiving it as a gift. So it's counterintuitive. It kind of goes against our flow. How many of you guys like, uh, you might be just unsophisticated enough to like country music. Anybody like, anybody like that? Because that's how I am too. I like country music too. One of the great themes of country music is uh, the working man. Now, there's a lot of songs about the working man. He's out there swinging the hammer. He's out there driving the tractor. He's out there driving the truck. He's making money all week, so on the weekends, he can go nuts. I mean, that's the whole, that's like almost every country song, you know. And so why do we like that music? Because there's something inside of us where we want to earn what we get. But when it comes to Jesus, you can't earn anything. You can't do anything to earn, to be, to be right with God. Jesus has already done it all when he's crucified on the cross. And so this is the message of Galatians. That's what we're going to be talking about. Now, when you get into the book of Galatians, there's this whole background that you need to be aware of. St. Paul, greatest Christian in the first century, St. Paul and one of his buddies, Barnabas, they went around this region of Galatia. This region of Galatia is in uh, where modern-day Turkey is. You can see that. They went around to these towns. It's in the green there. And St. Paul and Barnabas, you can read about it in the book of Acts, they go around to all these towns in the region of Galatia, and they preach the gospel. And they preach the gospel of grace, and people receive Jesus by faith. And then St. Paul and Barnabas start churches in all of these little towns. So this region of Galatia has all of these people who are Christians because of St. Paul, and they have all of these churches in these cities because of St. Paul. Now, later on, St. Paul, um, after he went around teaching them, some teachers came into these churches that St. Paul had started. And these teachers were called the Judaizers. And the Judaizers went into these churches and see what happened when you started these churches. St. Paul always went and started churches with Jewish people. He would go to the synagogues when he went to these towns. He would preach the gospel of grace to these Jewish people, and then some of them would become believers in Jesus. And then they would start churches with these Jewish believers. So the OG believers in every church, they were all Jews, cultural and ethnic Jews. But then, because they were in majority Gentile cities, it wasn't long before Gentiles began to believe in Jesus, and they too were in this church with these Jewish people. Now, the Jewish people followed the Old Testament laws, including circumcision. And so when these Gentiles started to come in, it irritated the Jewish Christians because they were like, hey, these Gentiles have got to get with the Jewish program if they want to get into this Jesus religion. And so they were basically teaching, if you want to become a good Christian, first you have to become a good Jew. And they thought that following the Old Testament regulations and laws were prerequisites to becoming a Christian. That's who the Judaizers were. But St. Paul's pushing back because St. Paul says, that's not the gospel. The gospel of Jesus is not that you keep some rules. The gospel of Jesus is that you receive Christ by faith. And St. Paul said there's some information that everyone has to know and be aware of in order for them to become a Christian. Here's what the information is. If you say, what is the gospel to St. Paul? He said, here's the gospel information. Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross for our sins. He was buried and then God raised him from the dead. That's what St. Paul said the gospel was. And you got to know that as you read the book of Galatians. That's the subtext, the Judaizers versus the gospel of grace. So church family, let me just ask you, let's repeat it back to him. Let's say it out loud. Are you ready, church family? Hey, church family, what is the gospel? Jesus was crucified on the cross for our sins. He was buried, and then God raised him from the dead. 
That is the gospel. But then how does someone become a Christian? You become aware of the information. How do you obtain salvation for yourself? Well, it's been formulated like this, and I think it's really helpful. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That's the way we say it. So let's say that together, all right? Family church, how does somebody get saved? By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. You've got to keep that in mind. That's what St. Paul is teaching. And all of this tells us that what we're really dealing with is we're dealing with the gospel of works that the Judaizers were teaching versus the gospel of grace. It's the gospel of works. Do I have to do something to be saved versus the gospel of grace? I receive something in order to be saved. So let's read this text of Scripture. We're going to start reading in Galatians uh, chapter 1, verse 1. We'll read some, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. Here we go. You ready? Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished, astonished, astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you receive, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel, the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And this is the word of the Lord. And all God's people say, amen, because we receive God's word at Family Church. So if you have your program, you want to write some things down, that would be a really good idea, a good habit for you to get into. Let's start taking some notes. What can we learn from this text of Scripture? Number one, we learn that the gospel comes from God. We learn that the gospel comes from God. It's throughout this text of Scripture. If you look at verse 1, if your Bible's still open, St. Paul says, I'm an apostle because God made me an apostle. I want to pause right there. Because I want to make it clear what we mean when we say that St. Paul is an apostle. So the word apostle simply means one who is sent for a purpose. One who is sent for a purpose. So in that sense, a lot of Christians, almost, I mean, all Christians who consider themselves apostles, all of us have been sent into the world for a purpose. Uh, my mom's sitting right here. Uh, when I was in like middle school or older elementary school, sometimes my mom would be out of milk. She'd put me on my bike and say, go up to the convenience store and come back with a gallon of milk. So I was sent as an apostle to the convenience store to get the milk. I, I was apostolized by my own mother so that I would go and get the milk. That's a, a simple way to use the word and a, and a legitimate way to use the word. But when St. Paul says, I am an apostle of God, St. Paul is talking about a certain position, a set of gifts that was useful for a certain period of time in Christianity. So St. Paul was an apostle. The, the disciples of Jesus, the 12 disciples, they were all apostles. So what is an apostle the way Paul is using it? An apostle, the way St. Paul is using this term, is somebody who had direct personal contact with Jesus Christ here on the earth. 
Someone who had direct personal contact with Jesus Christ here on the earth. And why were these, what were these apostles sent out to do? Well, after Jesus was crucified and buried and raised from the dead, he ascended to heaven. And these disciples, these apostles received the Holy Spirit and they were sent by Jesus and the Holy Spirit to launch the worldwide Christian movement. And in order to help them launch that Christian movement, they were given some special signs and some special gifts. They could heal people. They could do some things that Christians today can't do in the same way. So these were apostles who had direct contact with Jesus Christ. They were apostolized by Jesus. He sent them out. They were given a special set of gifts, and it was there for a certain period of time. That's why the apostles are the ones who God used to write the entire New Testament of the Bible. They gave us the gift of the Scriptures. So these apostles, when these apostles died, St. Peter, St. Paul, St. James, when they died... Uh, then there were no more apostles like them ever. And we don't need any more apostles like them because in the first century, they were so effective at launching the Christian movement. We're getting the scriptures written, uh, uh, planting churches all over the world. They were so effective at it that today in West Palm Beach, Florida, in 2024, we are meeting, studying the doctrine of these apostles, the doctrines of Jesus Christ. And the reason I'm telling you this, the reason this is important, if you watch TBN or you watch television or you go somewhere, there are Christian leaders out there who are declaring themselves to be apostles. Now, if what they mean is, I've been sent for a purpose in the general sense, okay, then in that case, we're all apostles. But if what they mean is, I'm an apostle like St. Paul is an apostle, you better watch out. Because there are no apostles like St. Paul was an apostle anymore. There's no need for apostles like St. Paul. And when someone declares themselves an apostle, why would they do that? They're kind of saying, I'm not like one of these regular low-level pastors around here. I'm an apostle like St. Paul. I'm a, I'm a different kind of Christian leader. You better be careful with that. You better be careful with that. Because somebody is trying to manipulate you. Somebody is trying to use Bible words to get you to believe something about them that's not true. Let me tell you what we believe about pastors, because I'm a pastor. I don't believe that I have a better chance to walk with God than any of you. I'm just a man who's a sinner, who's saved by Jesus Christ. I have the Holy Spirit in me like you have the Holy Spirit in you. I have access to the Scriptures, the Bible, like you have access to the Scriptures in the Bible. I do have a set of gifts and a set of talents, and I have a, set, a calling from God. And this church called me, invited me to be your pastor. This church, I didn't appoint myself. This church called me and invited me to be your pastor. And there's a mechanism by which this church could uncall me as the pastor. You could fire me as a pastor. And if you ever want to, you can do that as a group. You say, well, why, why is that important? Because I'm not declaring myself the pastor of this church. We are agreeing that I'm the pastor of this church. I'm not coming up to them. I'm going to you, we're going to fire you, Pastor Jimmy. You can't fire me. I'm an apostle. <laughs> That's not true. We don't believe that. We just believe in regular men and women who are walking with God, who have a particular set of gifts and a calling, and we recognize that, and we invite them to have different leadership positions in the church. That's what you need to take away, because this apostleship that St. Paul had, he didn't declare it for himself. God declared him an apostle. Now, now St. Paul was saved as an adult. How many of you guys... How many of you guys if you're a Christian, how many of you guys became a Christian before you were 16 years old? How many of you guys became a Christian? Raise your hand really high. Don't be ashamed in the balcony. All right. How many of you guys became a Christian after you were 16 years old? Raise your hands. Yeah. So it's about 70-30, to be honest with you. About 70% of the people in this room who are Christians became Christians before you were 16. About 30% of you who are Christians became Christians after you were 16. St. Paul's like all you guys who became Christian basically as an adult. He became a Christian as an adult. It was a radical change of his life. And that's why he says in verse 7, I'm preaching the gospel that Jesus taught me. It's changed my life. I did not make this stuff up. And he says in verse 8, he says... He says, you better not listen to anybody who's teaching you a different gospel than the gospel that comes from God. And there are going to be people out there doing it, such as the Judaizers he was dealing with in Galatia. But he also says, he warns you, he says, hey, even if somebody says they talk to an angel, if what they heard from the angel is a different gospel than the gospel of grace of Jesus Christ, you should be careful with them. You should, you should stay away from them. You shouldn't listen to them. Because what they are teaching you is a different gospel that will send you to hell. You say, well, that would never, ever ever happen. Really? Where do you think Mormonism comes from? A guy says, I heard this from an angel, and it's a different gospel than Paul was preaching, but I got it from an angel. Where do you think Islam comes from? 
I, 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 a guy says, I heard it from an angel. And it's a different gospel than St. Paul was preaching, but I got it from an angel. St. Paul says, don't listen to them. It's a false gospel. You gotta, but now listen, people, very sincere people who are kind people, good people, the very sincere people believe all kinds of things. I'm not questioning the sincerity. I'm not questioning their character. I'm not questioning whether we should be their friends or be nice to them because we should. What I'm saying is if they believe what somebody says they heard from an angel and it's a different gospel than what St. Paul's preaching, it's a false gospel that sends people to hell. And that's why you got to stay away from that. That's the whole point of the book of Galatians. That's why in verse 12, St. Paul says, you don't like what I'm saying? I'm not even trying to please men. I'm not even trying to please men. I have to please God. And this is what God told me to say. That's what St. Paul's telling us. And this gospel of grace is so counterintuitive. Everybody wants to find a way to earn something with God. Inside every one of us is a little legalist trying to get out. Inside every one of us is just something inside of us that says, yeah, I kind of want to believe in Jesus, but surely I got to do something. I got to do some part of this. And St. Paul says, oh, no, the gospel of grace says you don't do anything. You receive it all by faith. This week on social media, I saw, it's in another country, I saw that there were all of these um, religious people who uh, were going to visit this shrine to have this religious experience. And part of the experience was they had to walk like a quarter mile on their knees. And they were walking across stone on their knees. And they were doing it as an act of penance. And as they do it, their knees become sore. Some of their knees bleed. And they're doing this to try to gain favor with God and try to show that they're sorry for their sins and they're trying to do an act of penance. Now listen, these are sincere people who are really trying to connect with God. So I'm not throwing shade on their motives or on their effort. What I'm saying is this is contrary to the gospel of grace. The gospel of grace tells you, check this out. You don't have to suffer for your sins. You don't have to punish yourself for your sins. The gospel of grace is Christ suffered for you in your place. All the suffering that needs to take place for your sins has taken place, and Christ did it all. When Jesus died, when he was at the end of his time, and and he had been suffering for our sins, Jesus said, it is, no, no, according to them, he must have said, it is mostly finished, but you guys got to take it from here. No, he said, it is finished, because all the suffering that needed to be suffered was suffered by Christ. And so we don't need to suffer for our sins. We need to punish ourselves for our sins. And again, I'm not throwing shade on the sincerity of people. I'm not throwing shade on their belief. What I'm saying is you don't need to do that. That is a gospel different from the one that St. Paul was preaching. Don't listen to the gospel that's different than this one. This is the gospel that comes from God. And the reason that this strikes a chord is if we were designing the gospel ourselves, if God put you in charge of come up with a plan, where anybody who wants to can have their sins forgiven and they can be right with God, every one of us would have a list of stuff to do. Well, first of all, you got to do this, and then you got to do this, and then you got to do this, and if you do all that, maybe. God says, no. What do you have to do? Receive Jesus by faith. It's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That's how you're saved. It comes from God. Number two on your notes, what else are we learning here? Number two, there is only one gospel. There is only one gospel. There's only one way that people can be saved, and that is faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. That's why St. Paul warns, verse 6, if you have your Bible, in verse 6, St. Paul says, be careful, you guys are listening to the Judaizers, you're turning to another gospel. You say, wait a minute, I thought you just said there's one gospel. How can there be another gospel? He's, he's, uh, he's putting air quotes around it. They're, you're turning to another gospel gospel. There is no other gospel. That's what St. Paul says next. He says, not that there is another gospel, but you're believing something that you're calling the gospel, but it's not the gospel at all because any gospel that's not the gospel of grace is not actually the gospel. It's something else. Well, what other gospel are we talking about? Remember the Judaizers. If you want to be a good Christian, you first have to become a good Jew. Now you say, well, I'm not wrestling with that. None of us want to become a good Jew in order to become a Christian. I know, but you have your own version of the Judaizers. You have your own version of things that you think you have to do in order to really be a Christian. And some of us would say, yeah, I'll kind of agree with that grace alone, faith alone, Christ, and all this stuff. But when, when you really come down to it in your heart of hearts, you, you, you have a hard time believing that. You mean, all I got to do is believe? All I got to do is receive Jesus by faith? That's all you got to do. That's the gospel of grace. You say, well, no one would actually oppose that. 
I don't know, if you read about the book of Acts. So the book of Acts chapters 13 through 15 kind of pairs nicely with the book of Galatians. You can read the narrative of the story, Acts chapter 13, 14, 15, for the letter that Paul's writing in Galatians. And let me tell you what the book of Acts says when it describes this situation in Galatia, Acts chapter 15, verse 1. It says, but some men came down from Judea, that's why we call them the Judaizers, and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. That is what they were saying. And that's why St. Paul says, don't listen to people who preach another gospel. There's only one gospel. That's why he says in verse 6, I am astonished that you would believe them. And why is Paul astonished? Because remember, Paul and Barnabas preached the gospel to these people the first time they ever heard it. Paul and Barnabas established these churches in these towns in Galatia. And after all of Paul, do you think, do you think that Paul is a pretty good teacher? Would you guess that he's a pretty good teacher? Pretty good, right? The best ever. And Paul's saying, I was with you guys personally. You heard all of my good teaching. I'll turn around and go to Jerusalem. I've only been in Jerusalem a little time, and I'm already finding out you're turning away from the gospel I preached to you and listen to these clowns, the Judaizers. I'm astonished that after all the good preaching I've done to you guys, now you're listening to these turkeys. I'm astonished. Well, after St. Paul teaches them, and they depart from the gospel believing these other guys, he says, verse 6, I can't believe you're deserting him who called you. I can't believe you're deserting God. He's saying, when you do, this, this is important. When you desert the true gospel, you desert God, Paul says. When you leave the gospel, you leave God. That's why he says you've deserted him. You've gone over to the dark side. You've switched teams. Don't do that. Because there's only one true gospel. There's only one way that people can be saved. It's by receiving Jesus by faith. So Paul says, are you going to believe the gospel of grace where you can really be saved or are you going to believe the gospel of works? The reason that the gospel of works is so terrible is you can never live up to it. You can never live up to it. You cannot keep the rules. So I don't know, Pastor Jimmy, you don't know me. I'm super religious. I can keep, I'm a massive rule keeper. You might be a massive rule keeper in certain areas. I guarantee you, you cannot keep God's rules. I guarantee you can't even keep your own rules very consistently. Some of you guys, some of you guys use bad words, don't you? I know, sometimes I do too. I'm not supposed to. I struggle with that. I've told you before. I say a bad word and then I tell myself, that's it. I'm never saying another bad word. I'm making a rule. That's the last bad word I say. Somebody cuts me off in traffic. Why? Because I can't even keep my own rules. I better be listening to the gospel of grace, don't you think? I need the grace of God poured out on me, poured over me. I need nothing but the gospel of grace. If you try to make me a rule keeper, I'm going to fail. I'm going to die. I'm going to go to hell. I need the gospel of grace poured over me so I can walk with God and go to heaven. And so do you. You know the problem with these false teachers, the Judaizers? It wasn't that they were teaching some other thing. So Paul taught Jesus crucified and raised from the dead. The Judaizers agreed with all that stuff. They weren't teaching some new fancy pants religion. They agreed with This is the problem with false teaching. False, the most effective false teachers will agree with the facts. So if you talk to the Judaizers, hey guys, do you believe that Jesus was the Son of God? Oh yeah. Do you believe he's crucified and buried and raised from the dead? Oh yeah. Do you believe that you can just receive him by faith and that's all you need to do? Oh no. <laughs> yeah, you receive him by faith, but come on, nobody believes that's really enough. You receive them by faith, but then you still have to, and then they give you their list of stuff that you have to do. That's false teaching. Jesus plus nothing is salvation. Now, some of you are already having a little argument with me right now. You're thinking, I'm going to send them an email. I'm sending them an email. <laughs> Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. Yeah, but you gotta, you're going to try to give me the context. I understand all the context. We'll talk more about that as we go through Galatians. But, but let me say it this way. This, this is what I think is, is kind of uh, helpful. If we take this cross and we make this cross the moment that you become a Christian. So some of you have become a Christian for a while. Some of you aren't Christians yet, but maybe you're thinking about it. We're going to make this cross the moment you believe in Jesus. This is the moment you're saved. This is the moment you're converted. What has to happen before you can be a Christian? What do you have to do before you can actually be a Christian? 
Well, we already said, you, you got to believe, right? So we know that you got to believe. So I'm going to put faith over here. So faith has to happen before you can become a Christian. If you don't have a faith, you, you don't, you're not a Christian, right? But if you believe, that has to happen before you. But what else do you have to commit to before you can become a Christian? What else do you have to agree to before you become a Christian? Well, I mean, you got to get baptized, right? Yeah, you should definitely get baptized if you're a Christian. Well, what else? You should be part of a church, don't you think? That's important for Christians. What about the Bible? Yeah, you got to read the Bible. I mean, that's part of it. Well, what about my sex life? I got to be sexually faithful as a single. As a, yeah, you got to be sexually faithful. Of course, Christians should do all this stuff. What about giving? Should I tithe? Yeah, you should tithe. Okay, but listen. You don't have to agree to any of that or do any of that before you become a Christian. All you have to do to become a Christian, according to the gospel of grace, is believe and receive Jesus Christ. That's it. Now, on the other side of the cross, after you become a Christian, yeah, baptism, let's do that. And some of you guys need to do that. You need to be obedient to Jesus. Let's get involved in a church uh, family. Let's become sexually uh, faithful. That, that's important in the Bible. Let's give, uh, let's give money uh, to our church family. That's important. Let's, let's read the Bible. There could be a lot of things you could put over here to be obedient to Christ, and you should. And every Christian should do all of these things. But you don't do these things in order to become a Christian. You become a Christian by faith, and then the Holy Spirit helps you begin to do these things. You see the difference in what I'm saying? So if you go to anybody and go, hey, before you can become a Christian, make sure you agree you're going to do all this stuff. That's not the gospel that St. Paul's preaching. St. Paul's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, crucified for your sins, raised from the dead. You receive him by faith, and then after you receive Jesus, this is all on the other side of the cross. He said, man, that's kind of radical. That's why Paul wrote a whole book about it. It was radical then, it's radical now. And again, I know some of you are already like, yeah, but do you really mean, do you really want to say, you got to be careful? I hear you, but you ought to be careful not to violate the gospel of grace. You ought to be careful that in your zeal to be obedient to Christ and to compel people to be obedient to Christ, that you don't give away the gospel of grace. Which brings you to number three on your notes. The gospel is received by faith. The gospel is received by faith. St. Paul said it later on in the book of Galatians. We read it earlier in the service. St. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Why do people lose confidence in the gospel of grace? We lose confidence in the gospel of grace because inside of us there's this voice that always wants to add something else to it. And there are these voices out there on TV and on the Internet or even in our own church that want to add something else to it. Listen to me, church family. I believe in obedience. I believe in being faithful. I believe in being rigorous. The gospel is not against effort as a Christian. It requires tremendous effort to walk with God. The gospel is not against effort. The gospel is against earning. The gospel is not against effort. The gospel is against earning. We don't have one thing to add to the gospel of grace. Christ has done it all. We receive them by faith. And what's awesome about that, some of you really wrestle because you feel so unworthy because of what you've done and what's happened to you and where you've been and the choices you've made. And you feel terribly unworthy. And the gospel of grace says there is a well of grace and mercy. There is forgiveness without end. There is grace that never runs out, and it's for you. And some of you hear me and you say, you know, I used to be a Christian, but then I made some terrible decisions and I've walked away for a long time. Do you think that Jesus can really put me back together again? And I tell you that he can. And I tell you that he will. And you've not gone so far that you can't come back. You can come back. God wants you back. We want you back. The grace of God is sufficient. And there's some of you that have a loved one and you're afraid that their heart is so hard and they've gone so far that they can't 
ever come to God. And I'm telling you, the grace of God is sufficient. Don't give up on anybody because the grace of God, the gospel of grace, man, is big enough to reach the sinner with the hardest heart. And to help us remember that every Sunday at Family Church, we take the Lord's Supper. When we take the Lord's Supper, it reminds us of the body of Jesus that was broken for us, of the blood of Jesus that was shed for us so we can be forgiven, so that we can be saved. Now, the Lord's Supper is for believers in Jesus. If you're here today, you never received Jesus by faith, I don't recommend that you take the Lord's Supper. If you're here and you're not a Christian yet, why don't you wait? Sing the songs, pray, lean in. But why don't you wait until after you become a believer for yourself? Then you can take the Lord's Supper with integrity. And at Family Church, we believe and we teach it's best for you to take the Lord's Supper after you've been baptized and after you become a part of a neighborhood church. Now, if you're here today, you say, I'm a Christian and I have a church. It's not this church. Okay, if you're a Christian and you would take the Lord's Supper at your church, take it with us today as part of the extended family of Jesus that goes around the world. But right now, let's take a moment to reflect. Let's draw close to the Lord. Let's confess our sins to God. Let's remind ourselves of the massive beautiful grace of God that has been poured out on us in Jesus Christ. Let's push away from our hearts. Let's let's put to death any idea, any thought that we have of earning anything from God. And let's remind ourselves that Christ has finished it all for us and we receive it by faith. So let's think, let's pray, let's consider, let's meditate. And then in just a minute, we'll eat and drink the Lord's Supper together. What has washed me clean is the blood of Christ. Where can we find hope in His sacrifice? Who has loved us so? Who has paid it all? Only Jesus Christ, the Lord. All our sin cast off. All our shame he bore for the cross declares settled is the score for the sting of death has a hold no more. Oh, we sing to Christ the Lord. All our sin cast off. All our shame he bore for the cross declares settled is the score for the sting of death has a hold no more who oh, we sing to Christ the Thank you for being the church in here with us at Family Church at Home. Right now, all in-person neighborhood churches are about to take the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a family meal for those who are baptized believers. To learn more about baptism as your next step, check out a neighborhood church near you and plan your visit at gofamilychurch.org. We'd love to connect with you face-to-face. I hope you have an amazing week, Family Church.